So today we are uh, continuing this Who Needs Christmas series, but I want to take just a second and uh, thank all of you once again for being here, both in person and online, and I really want to speak to all of you online at this moment. Uh, I've run into so many of you who have said to me, either, Pastor John, I love online worship, it's the best, I get to be in my jammies, and we get on Facebook, and we interact with people, and then I've run into others who say, we start a half an hour before the service to figure out how to get the service on so we can find it. We can't figure out how to comment, but we're there with you. We're with you in spirit, we promise. I wanna speak to both groups, those who love this, those who hate this, those who struggle with this, those who wish they could be here in person. We appreciate you being with us. We love that you can join us in this way, and we are honored to be here with you and to worship alongside you. So look, who needs Christmas? We're continuing this series. If you missed the first two weeks, it's okay. I'm gonna quickly catch you up. The very first week we talked about who needs Christmas and we said the world needed Christmas and we talked all about that. The second week we said who needs Christmas and we said God needs Christmas. We talked about the God who became one of us, Emmanuel, and needed Christmas to, sh to be among us and to be with us in order to save us. Well, today we're gonna to be talking about who needs Christmas and we're gonna be talking about the message of Christmas, the message of Christmas. But before I get into that, I have this really simple question for you. If you're online, you can answer the question literally. If you're in person, I want you thinking about it. The question is, do you know what your name could have been? This would be like if you were born a girl and you're a guy, or if you were born a guy and you're a girl, or maybe an alternate name that your parents couldn't figure out. Do you know what your name could have been? If you know and you're online, go ahead and comment down below yes and even share the name. If you don't know, might I suggest reaching out to a family member and seeing if they know, finding out what your name could have been. Because here's the thing, when I was writing this message this week, I realized I had no idea what my name could have been. Now, for some of you, you know this about me, I was initially a junior. I was John Lawrence Drake Jr. I was named after my biological father and then in middle school, in middle school, I was adopted by my stepdad and my name changed to John Alden Martin. I don't tell anybody my middle name, so please keep that secret safe for me. I'm not a fan of that, right? I don't like it. It was named after my grandpa. But I never knew what my name was gonna be if I was a girl, so I texted my mother and I said, Mom, what was my name going to be? And she said, are you sure you want to know? This is how you know it's good. And I said, yes, I need, I need to know. And so she, she texted back this name. Go ahead and put it up now. It is Ann. Naomi Dawn, and of course my last name would have been Drake. Ann, Naomi, Dawn, Drake. And I said, where do we come up with that name? And she said, well, those three names are named after four grandmothers. Yes, that's right, four. Two of them shared the name Naomi. One of them hated the name Naomi and didn't go by Naomi. The other one apparently was okay with Naomi. That was going to be my name. Now, if your name is Ann or Naomi or Dawn, like that's awesome for you. I really like the name John. I'm really glad that I have John and not three first names as my name. Uh, see, here's the thing about a name. A lot goes into a name, right? I mean, it means a lot. It turns out that you might have a really common name. And so anytime somebody says that name, like seven of you turn your head to, to see who they're talking to. Or maybe you have a really unique name and you're the only one like you. And so when you run into somebody else with that name, you're like, that's, that's my name. I'm the only one with that name. Maybe your name is really easy to say and teachers never struggled with it. Maybe it's really hard to say and people your entire life have mispronounced it. Perhaps you're named after someone or maybe you're named just because your parents like that name. Maybe you're named uh, with a purpose, like your name has some kind of deep meaning and now for the rest of your life you have to live up to that deep meaning. Maybe not. But the message of Christmas is built around a name. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking we're in church, so the answer is either Jesus, God, or love. Amen? That's, that's probably what you're thinking. And kind of, the name is Jesus. But I want to share a secret with you. We've been saying his name wrong for 2,000 years. See, it turns out Jesus' name was Yeshua, which, if you haven't figured it out, that's where we get our English name Joshua from. It's just that when they translated into Greek, they had no sh noise. And so instead of Yeshua, it was Yesuas. And English speakers just said, yeah, that's Jesus. I'm saying his name wrong. It's okay. I think it's okay. 
But Joshua, if you know anything about your Bible, Joshua was a mighty warrior, a general. He was the one who led the people into the promised land and then kicked butt and took names of all the people who were living there to kick them out of the promised land. And the people of God were expecting the Messiah to come as one like Joshua, a mighty warrior who was going to kick butt and take names, not of the people in the promised land, but of the Romans who had enslaved and, and uh, held captive the Jewish people. Jesus came with that weight upon his shoulders and he completely flipped that upside down. So we're gonna talk more about that today. And to do that, we're gonna use Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 23. The context you need to understand here is that we have multiple versions of the Christmas story. We have Matthew and Luke, right? Luke is Mary's version of the story. Matthew is Joseph's version. And so today we're gonna to be looking at Joseph's side of the story. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is God's word, it's given freely to each and every one of you. I wanna take you back to verse 18. In verse 18, we're told that this is how things came to be. Joseph and Mary were pledged to be married. Now, that word that we translate pledged, it literally means like to give a souvenir, to give a gift. It sounds an awful lot like what we would consider in the 21st century, an engagement, right? They are engaged to be married, but it's a little more than that. We know it's a little more than that if we keep reading in the next verse, but let me tell you that that word pledged, it was like a hair's breadth away from married. It wasn't just we have a fight and you can take your ring back or I'm gonna take your ring to the local pawn shop. It was, if we have a fight and wanna break this off, we have to go to court and have legal papers drawn up to officially separate, to divorce. So that's what's going on in this story here. They're that tightly bound. If we move to verse 19, in verse 19, that's where Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. And because he's faithful to the law, right? She's been unfaithful to him. And yet, because he doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he decides he's going to quietly divorce her, quietly. Now, there's a lot of thoughts and theories around why quietly, why Joseph would do this so quietly. Now, it could be that this is all about saving Mary and himself from embarrassment and shame. Of course, prior to the first century, before the Romans came, this was something that according to the Jewish law, unfaithfulness to one's spouse was punishable by death. So maybe Joseph was worried that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders, were gonna make an example of her and kill her. Some people have even suggested that Joseph thought Mary was mentally ill that she came to him and said, I'm pregnant, but I've never known a man. It was God who impregnated me. Some people say Joseph heard that and thought, she's obviously not well. I'm not gonna rub salt in an open wound. I'm not gonna kick this poor girl when she's down. We're just gonna end this quietly. I suggest to you that maybe what's going on here is that Joseph actually loved her. He actually cared for her. And even though he was thoroughly convinced that she had been unfaithful to him, he was unwilling to cause harm to her because he still loved her and wanted good for her. Irregardless of the reason, Joseph decides to do this quietly. Now, this is a commitment, by the way, that Joseph had made and wanted to get out of. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made a commitment to somebody and wanted to get out of said commitment? Like, maybe it's a little thing like, oh, I told my friend I'd help him move, but now it's raining and I don't wanna help them move. Or maybe it's something like, well, I told my in-laws I would go to their house for Christmas dinner, 
but I really don't want to go to my in-law's house for Christmas dinner. Maybe it's something bigger, like you started a job and you're like, I don't want to keep working this job, so I'm going to quit this job. I'm not sure what that is, but I think all of us can relate with that. Of course, the scale of this is so much larger. If we move on to verse 21, though, you see in verse 21, we have the angel speaking to Joseph and saying, do not do that. As a matter of fact, the angel says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, or as I told you early on, Joshua, because he will save. And this is the part where Joseph knows where this is going. He knows who Joshua was. And so when the angel tells him he will save, Joseph is like, yeah, I know what he's going to save all of us from the Romans. The angel continues, save his people. And Joseph's like, attaboy, Joseph, you figured it out, you know. And then the angel flips the script and he says, he will save his people from their sins. It's at that point that Joseph is thinking, no, you're mistaken. We have salvation from our sins. It's called the temple. We go and we sacrifice and we are forgiven. We make atonement and we move on our merry way. And this is the same kind of thing that happens with us as Christians. We hear this language of save from our sins and we say, no, I got that. Don't worry. God forgave me already. Amen. And so it's at this point that you're saying, okay, the message of Christmas Apparently, it's salvation, but who needs that, right? Who needs Christmas? Who needs salvation? We, we've already been forgiven, and Joseph was saying, well, we need to be saved from the Romans, but we don't need salvation from sin. We've got the law and the temple. And here's the truth of this. You need Christmas. You need salvation, and you need salvation, and you need salvation, and you need salvation. Each and every one of us needs this. Because it turns out that when the angel says to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when he says to him, she will give birth to a son and you name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is big. This is bigger than just make atonement at the temple. This is bigger than just forgiven. See, that's the mistake that so many of us make is we say, oh, Christmas is all about God forgiving us, sending little baby Jesus that we might be forgiven. There's a subtle distinction between forgiven and saved. Let me, let me uh, draw this out for you, hopefully. If we're just forgiven, then I'm gonna keep doing it again and again and again. If I'm saved, something more is happening here. As a matter of fact, we could say that not only are we saved, but we're freed, freed from sin. Let me show this to you in a, in a story. This is a story that comes from your Bible. This isn't a story from my life. This is a story from your Bible. It actually comes from the book of John, John's gospel in your Bible, chapter eight. I'm gonna loosely paraphrase this. So Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem during the biggest time of year. And there are crowds around him as he's sitting on the temple steps teaching. Now, if you've never been to the temple in Jerusalem or you've never seen pictures, the temple steps are not like tiny little steps. They are massive, huge steps. And he is sitting on these massive, huge steps teaching a huge crowd. And in the midst of his teaching, there arises a commotion at the back of the crowd. And probably if people were listening, they could hear it through the city streets. But it comes to the crowd and it makes its way through the crowd. And all of a sudden, the onlookers realize that it's a bunch of religious leaders. The hoity-toity, the super Jews, right? The ones who always get the answers right. And they come marching their way through the crowd with a woman who so obviously does not want to be there. They're pushing and pulling and dragging her there. Tears streaming down her face. And they make her stand in front of those massive steps and that huge crowd and Jesus. And you see, they're using this woman as a ploy, as a trick, as a test. And they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. She was caught red-handed being unfaithful. And the law says she should be killed, stoned. 
which if you don't know what that's like, it's where they put you down in a pit and people throw giant boulders on you until you are dead. And they say to Jesus, this is their test. What do you say we should do? The hope is that he'll say, let her go. And then they can be like, oh, Jesus is soft on the law. Or the hope is that he'll say, yes, stone her. And then they can call the Romans because see, Jews weren't allowed to put people to death. That's why Jesus was crucified. Because they weren't allowed to kill people on their own. That was the Romans' job. And so Jesus is stuck in this trap. And yet Jesus does just the coolest thing. Some of you may know this story. See, the first thing he does is he calls their bluff. He says, yeah, sure, go ahead. Take her down to the valley, because you couldn't do it there at the temple. Take her down to the valley of Gehenna, just outside the city, and stone her. But then he adds this really famous phrase, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. See, they fell into Jesus' trap. Now, sadly and quietly, one at a time, these religious leaders, these super Jews, leave, realizing that none of them is without sin because all of us have sinned. This next part of the story you may not know. Jesus looks up to the woman and says, has anyone condemned you? And she says, no, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I. Now, you might know that part. That's kind of famous. And that's Jesus saying, I forgive you. It's important. But the part that always gets left out of the story, and the part that I need you all to hear really clearly, is he doesn't stop talking with neither do I. He then says to her, this comes from John's gospel. I'm going to read this to you. It's it's John, what is it? Go ahead and throw it up there, guys. It's John chapter 8, verse 11. He says, go now and sin no more. See, Jesus doesn't just say you're forgiven. He also says you are free. You are saved from sin. Now, if she wasn't free from sin, it would be unfair and unkind to say sin no more. And yet Jesus knows that he has come not only to forgive us of sin, to save and free us from sin. And so he says, go now and sin no more. And so I'll ask you again, who needs Christmas? And of course, the answer to who needs Christmas is you need Christmas. You as an individual need Christmas. You need it because the message of Christmas is one of salvation. The message of Christmas is all about being saved. Freed, not just forgiven, freed from sin. And so I want to end today with this question for all of you, online, in person. This is the question that I want in your noodle today, tomorrow, this week. And that is, will you go and sin no more? You've been forgiven. You've been saved and freed. So now will you go? and sin no more. Pray with me if you would. God, Christmas is a wonderful time of year. The message of Christmas is not simply forgiveness. It's not simply gifts and blessings. It is salvation. It is truly, in the deepest sense, freedom. Help us not only to hear about, to know about, to feel that freedom, but to live into that that we may find ourselves this day and every day going and sinning no more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.